All right, everybody, take a breather from work, will ya? It'll be there when you get back. I got a happy one for you. <laughs> Dark City. And we ain't talking Asbury Park, New Jersey, neither. I'm talking 1950 space demons in trench coats. And if you think that's weird, check this out. Come on, roll the tape. Dark City looks like a poor man's version of The Matrix, because it came out a year before Keanu Reeves' stellar performance as a one-note man with a limited acting range. To others, Dark City is simply the Australian version of The Matrix, because it starts with a man waking up in a bathtub with no recollection of what happened the night before. But for most people, it straddles the line between goofy mishmash of far-out ideas and a befuddling genre splice-up that falls short of its lofty ambitions. Clearly, New Line Cinema had their own reservations about audiences being divided. To ensure that people could follow the plot, they forced the director to stick it on a voiceover at the start, which explains the entire movie. Seriously. It's worse than those modern movie trailers which spoil the entire movie. In any case, the film stands out as a firm example of the cyberpunk trend that dominated Planet Earth's approach to the millennium. It's a time where studios were willing to take risks on original, bold ideas rather than exclusively adapt pre-existing intellectual property. It was also the time of leather pants and wearing sunglasses indoors. But enough about our fashion regrets. But if you want to know what modern Hollywood was like before comic book movies and 80s franchise revivals, then wrap your head around this mind bender. It's part neo-noir detective story, part sci-fi dystopian conspiracy, and there's even a bit at the end where everyone is flying around bouncing off the walls. Do you remember when Prince changed his name to just a symbol? Describing this movie is like trying to pronounce that. Fabulous production design and super spooky strangers who operate from the shadows. Or maybe it's because no one brought a lamp to set. Seriously, this movie can be dark both thematically and literally. Would it have killed the producers to splash out on a couple more lights? But if you turn the brightness up on your screen, you'll be able to watch Rufus Sewell play John Murdoch as he searches for answers in a world steeped in mystery. Questions like, why does everyone fall asleep at midnight? Why do the buildings move and grow at night? Where is the beach that everyone has memories of but can't get to? If Murdoch didn't commit the murders, why is he being set up? And perhaps the biggest question of all, who is Rufus Sewell? Seriously, the lead for this movie is just some guy. It's strange to watch a big movie where the lead is an unknown, whereas everyone around them is much more famous. This must be what it feels like to be the only member of the Jackson family who never got into singing and dancing. There's Kiefer Sutherland, Jennifer Connelly, and William Hurt. Not John Hurt, just William Hurt. He's the guy from Lost in Space. The film, not the TV show. And we mean the original show, not the Netflix reboot. If that's confusing you, then good. That's what the filmmakers were going for. They worked hard to make sure that the audience couldn't pin the location to a fixed time or space. There's modern tech, but 50s references. It looks like the future, but everything is old and decaying. So maybe it's set in Detroit. There are more deliberate anachronisms in this movie than the film producer who tried to make Titanic 2. That probably would have done better at the box office, because unfortunately, Dark City bombed harder than Pearl Harbor. The movie, not the attack. That sucks. Yet critics like it. Roger Ebert sung praises for its daring vision and bold plot, even going so far as to call it the best movie of 1998. That's the same year he's saving Private Ryan, The Big Lebowski, and A Night at the Roxbury. But not everyone could be won over. 30 seconds. For some, the slick images, impressive set design, and downright bonkers twists and turns just exasperated the fact that the movie was trying to do too much. Yet some people took note of it. It's hard to imagine that the Wachowski siblings hadn't taken influence from Dark City when the time came to make their own movie about a man realizing the world is a lie. In fact, some of the set pieces were sold to the Matrix production. It seems fair to say that Dark City walked so the Matrix could run. Or put another way, Dark City stumbled so the Matrix could float in the air and do that 360 rotation special effect before Trinity boosts that cop through the wall? <laughs> My own. If I had the Matrix karate download, I'd kick every cop that looked at me funny too. I know Kung Fu. Shh. 
show me. <laughs> At the end of the day, it was hard to watch. I sat through the damn thing and fought against every reason to turn it off. But I'm a professional. I finish everything I start. All in all, I'd give it what Roger Ebert should have. Two thumbs down. May he rest in peace. I know it's a cult classic, but I could have spent my time better playing a high-stakes game of Monopoly with stolen property. But that's about all I got for you. Hopefully you enjoyed my expert analysis of this gem. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and pick up a like. If you're anything like me, you'll share it with the family. We'll pick it up next week with another one. Forget about it.